Good morning. A lot of you out there, you look like a, a phytoplankton sample. Many of you, many of you. Uh, <laughs> when I actually saw the title of my talk in print, I was asked to do this uh, a few months ago, but when I saw it in print, I, I recall thinking that anyone reading the title might expect me to talk about the activities of a local church and how one's life might fit into those activities. But then I read the title again and I saw the words differently. I saw the title as Life in the Church or Life Found in the Church. Today I'd like you to consider the church as an important life-giving community that feeds and nourishes your heart, your mind, and your soul. I'd like to hearken back to Dr. Riken's beginning chapel message addressing Ecclesiastes 3.11. You might recall he used the phrase, why bother? Why bother being involved in a local church? I want to address this very question this morning. Why bother becoming committed to a church during your years at Wheaton College? In preparation, I asked former and current students their personal reflections regarding this topic, so perhaps you might resonate uh, with one or more of their thoughts. I also want to consider Christian community within a local church and compare and contrast that to our community here at Wheaton College. And lastly, I will share part of my spiritual journey where I received the life-transforming work of God in my life through a church during my college years. I can definitely say that I, I wouldn't be standing here now speaking to you if I had not been involved in a local church during the time that I was a student. As uh, Chaplain Kello said, I'm a biologist. I'm actually a marine biologist right here near the ocean. Uh, I love spending time underwater enjoying God's incredible creation. I love learning and teaching about the diversity of animals, so many amazing critters out there in the world around us. Humans, of course, are very special in his creation because we are created in his image. However, those of you who have had me in class know that I am specifically an invertebrate zoologist. So as much as I'm amazed and in awe of the human body, I also appreciate those critters that do not have backbones. So uh, last spring, uh, there was this uh, indoor triathlon at the SRC, and I got a little in too intense. My first mistake was trying to compete with Dr. Peter Walters in that event. <laughs> I ended up needing knee surgery, um, and more than once in the recovery process, all the medical people would say, surely you understand all the tendons and the muscles that need to be healed and recovered and that. And more than once, my response was, um, I'm a little rusty on the details of the human knee because I'm an invertebrate biologist. But ask me anything you need to know about hydroids and squid, and I can help you out. Um, so speaking of invertebrates and those of us that enjoy invertebrates, I'd like to have one of my, uh, I was going to say invertebrate comrades, but uh, Corbin is not an invertebrate. He is a student that loves invertebrates as I love invertebrates. And so I'm going to ask Corbin to come and read scripture for us today. He is a huge fan of cephalopods, the group that includes the squid and the octopuses. His shirt says it all. So. Before Corbin comes to read, again, I'd like to follow Dr. Riken's lead and ask you to please put away your phones and pull out your Bibles. If you don't have a Bible with you, we will have the verses on the screen. Corbin? A reading from 1 Corinthians 12. Just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all its parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. But in fact, God has placed the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. A reading from Colossians 1. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, 
so that in everything he might have the supremacy. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Corbin. Please join me in prayer as we unpack this topic today. Father, I do pray that you would open the eyes and ears of our hearts to see and hear what you have for each of us this morning. I ask that each of us would be receptive to the work of your spirit, and I ask this so that the name of Christ would be glorified. Amen. The verses we just read are familiar to many of you. If you've not heard a teaching about this concept, I'd encourage you to explore it in greater depth to see how the Lord might speak to you through this portion of his word. These verses remind us that Christ is the head of the church, and we are the members of that body, members of a community of believers. We are each important members or part of the body of Christ, that is, the church. Because I'm a biologist, I bet many of you are thinking that I will focus on the image of the human body as it re relates to being involved in the church. I'm actually not going to do that this morning. I want to emphasize the healing and spiritual growth that can occur in each of us when we are engaged in relationships within the Christian community of a local church. Um, in addition to uh, what I'd like to say, uh, those of you that have had me in class, you know I'm a visual learner. I'm big on visual aids. So here is my visual aid, an anchor. So stay tuned, and I'll come back to this in a few minutes. Keep you with me. There. Here are some thoughts from some of your peers regarding church uh, during their time at Wheaton, along with some of my insights. Some of you are already actively involved in a local church, and you're probably thinking, hey, I'm good to go. I want to challenge you in this community to ask your friends, friends that perhaps aren't attending a church, to attend church with you. Give them a ride or invite them to attend with you. Others of you may think, I'm only here for four or fewer years, so why make a commitment when I'll be leaving? My question to you is, why do you invest in friendships when you know you're going to be leaving Wheaton in a few years? Last week in chapel, we were admonished to help each other be faithful to Christian fellowship. For others of you, Wheaton is perhaps a dangerous place. Some of you may think that you don't need church because you're actively involved in the Christian community of Wheaton College. This is what one of my former students sent in an email. Many believe they don't need church because they get church every other day of the week through devotions in class or conversations throughout the week. That's true, yes. Many of you are involved in DSG groups. You attend all school or floor worship events. You have class devotions and department and campus chapels. Here we are. You do grow and you are challenged spiritually by your peers but you can grow and be challenged even more in different ways from people outside our Wheaton community. People that have had life experiences you have yet to have. These are people that have gone before you, if you will. A church provides a diversity of people that can share their life lessons with you. Last week, Clayton even said that he'd be excited to see DSG attendance decrease a little bit if involvement in local churches would increase. There is also something to be said about things we do on a regular basis. Pastor Ken encouraged us to consider habits in developing a rhythm of life. And last week in chapel, again, you were challenged to be intentional in developing that habit, a habit of being involved in a church. Why? to sustain your faith in Christ over a lifetime. I'd like to encourage you to enhance your spiritual growth by being involved in a church. Also by committing to a local church while here at Wheaton, you may have the opportunity to select your own church, perhaps different than that of your parents. This is an important step for some of you, growing in your faith and owning your faith in a more real and meaningful way. This process certainly will prepare you for the day when you no longer will be a student. 
One of the things I hear the most from my students that have graduated is that it is hard to become assimilated in a church after graduation. There can be several reasons for that, of course, but perhaps for some it's because they didn't really plug into a local church while here at Wheaton. Let's now look at the concept of Christian community and how the college and a local church are similar and different. In his book, Life Together, Dietrich Bonhoeffer says the following about Christian community, and I believe this relates to the church. It is not an ideal which we must realize, it is rather a divine reality created by God in Christ in which we may participate. Wheaton College is a great community. It's a great Christian community, but it's not a church. We are academics. I'm a professor. You are students. I'm here to teach. You're here to learn. And we can do that, yes, in the context of our faith. But listen to the recently revised mission statement for the college. Wheaton College serves Jesus Christ and advances his kingdom through excellence in liberal arts and graduate programs that educate the whole person to build the church and benefit society worldwide. So our mission is to build the church, not be a church. Scholars such as John Stott and others describe these marks of a church. It's a community that includes the following teaching or instruction of God's word or scripture, worship, sacraments such as baptism and communion, or what Augustine refers to as visible words. I love that description. Ministries and service to one another and to those outside the church. Yes, some of these marks are observed on our campus at varied times, but not all of them. And the frequency and the regularity of these in our lives is important. For example, we have all-campus communion, but there is something to be said for receiving communion more often. When preparing for communion, we hear the words, do this in remembrance of me. I trust maybe you're like me. I need reminders. I need them often to uh, help keep my focus on Christ. This is why many churches observe the sacrament often, if not weekly. I'd like to spend the rest of my time sharing a little bit about my spiritual journey and talking about relationships in the church. As you heard in recent chapels, spiritual friendships are of great value. Relationships with people that share a common faith in Christ and who are committed to admonish and encourage one another spur us on and help us in our faith, our faith commitment. So I'd like to reflect on how relationships with Christians of diverse vocations and age can be mutually beneficial in ways that will bring about spiritual growth. The relationships that I found in a local church with more mature Christians were critical in my life for my personal and spiritual growth. The church I attended while in college provided examples of godly and healthy relationships. The pastor of the church I attended, Roy, and his wife, Janice, uh, cared for me as one of their own daughters. Roy was a pretty active guy. Uh, in addition to being a pastor, he coached high school volleyball and played tennis, and so um, he was just engaging with all sorts of people in all sorts of communities, a really amazing man. I came from a family that had its own unique issues. Every family does. And my parents' marriage had some challenges. So I had issues. I had personal issues that affected aspects of my very being. I'd go home for the holidays, and it took time to recover when I came back to school. I needed God's healing grace in my life. I love my parents and family, but I was the youngest of five, and there was abuse in our family. So one day, Roy sat me down, and he said, Look, Nadine, you have a choice. You can either begin dealing with your issues now and let the church help pay for your therapy, or you can keep ignoring these hurts, and they will just keep coming back to stymie your personal and your spiritual growth. 
Well, uh, the hard part for me was uh, many hard parts, but I worked my way through college, undergrad, master's, PhD, so it took a big step for me get, to get over the pride of receiving help. Came from a middle class family, the summers I'd worked two to three jobs. When I was in college, I did a lot of house sitting, which I loved because, you know, all the fun food in the fridge that you as a student typically perhaps wouldn't purchase. Um, in addition to all those really neat pets, cats, dogs, fish, birds. So it was really fun for me, but I had to save every dollar for school. So it was hard for me to accept the church's assistance. But once I started seeing a Christian therapist, I was on a path of healing. God transformed and healed me in incredible ways. At that time, I was so, so shy. Uh, it was painful. And the shame of my life up to that point was just crippling. I lacked the confidence and I could not talk in front of people. You all just close your eyes right now, I'll feel a little better. Okay, um, so as an undergrad, I conducted research and the professor that I worked with, he said, look, we need to practice this before you go to the conference, the national conference. And he said, let's just go practice in front of the graduate students, people I knew. I refused, I refused. I just could not do that. So the Lord has obviously grown and healed me in many ways, and I never dreamed of becoming a professor, never. And I would not be standing here now without that initial loving push from Pastor Roy. I was also in a Bible study with Pastor Roy and his wife Janice, and um, I know that my experience of being in this Bible study may not happen easily for some of you, you may have to be intentional in finding places and ways of becoming involved in a local church in the way that I was. But I strongly encourage you to pray and bring your needs before the Father. This Bible study group consisted of folks um, from various ages and walks of life. Being a student, I was the youngest, so this was good for me. Uh, there, was a single, there were single married folks um, older and younger, some had children. One woman was a widow with two children. And this is where I met Mary Moore. This is an old picture, obviously, but um, Mary was an older woman who had very arthritic fingers, but she was one of the best piano and organ players ever. She'd worked for the government and played for one of the large churches in DC before retiring. And I can't recall how we became friends but we developed an amazing spiritual friendship. I can now look back and see that it was God's love and grace being poured out to me through Mary. She overwhelmed me with unconditional love from Christ. She's a very dynamic woman who loved life. She had a wonderful carefree laugh. She grew up in Panama and we just had great conversations about her exploring tide pools and finding all sorts of neat marine critters. And Mary became a friend, a mother, and a grandmother for me. I'd ride my bike to her house, we'd sit on the screened-in porch, and we'd have coffee, and I felt free to chat about anything and everything with Mary. I remember she always wanted her china teacup filled only halfway with coffee so that she could drink her coffee hot. If we filled it up, she didn't get through it, it would get cold. I could drop by any time. She'd have me over for dinner for, uh, on a regular basis. And she would say, I could serve you peanut butter and jelly for dinner and you'd be fine with that. And I was fine with that because in reality, I was being fed spiritually. I learned much by simply being with Mary. And I was able to give back and serve Mary by helping her with things around the house. She gave me a table for my apartment that we still have today. We call it the Mary Moore table. And she actually gave me a variety of things. She also gave me this chair. This chair is in my study at home, and this is where I spend my time studying the Word and in prayer. One of the many things Mary taught me was how to pray. How did I learn that? By simply watching and being with her. Her prayers were authentic. You know those people that pray and they sort of got that direct connect and it's like you are not even in the room. 
That was Mary. And every time she prayed her humble prayer, every time Mary would ask, Father, give us hearts of gratitude. And that prayer became my prayer. That prayer has shaped and changed me behaviorally and spiritually. And I've seen God grow that prayer in my own heart and in my own life, and for that I am grateful. So, why did I carry this thing to show you, this anchor? This is a symbol that speaks to my heart and mind and hopefully to yours. It reminds me of Hebrews 6.19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul firm and secure. When I was preparing this chapel, I ironically met a player on the women's basketball team in the SRC, and um, this is her life verse. We ended up talking about this a bit. And this is a reminder that our hope is in Christ. Christ is a spiritual anchor for when the storms of life come and the waves pick up. The Christian community of a church has helped anchor me in the hope of Christ so many times during my college days and the years to follow. The church is where I regularly hear the word, worship, receive sacrament, all within the context of diverse and godly relationships that help deepen my ability to know the reality of Jesus Christ. We all have choices. And we need to be intentional about promoting our spiritual growth in Christ. Choosing involvement in a church during your college years is a wise choice. We regularly need God's grace. You and I need confession, forgiveness, mercy. We each were created to need as well as show God's love, grace, forgiveness, and mercy each day to one another. Don't wait to plug into a church community. You can receive and give on a regular basis by engaging in a church. Christian community, especially that of the church, is a gift given to us by God, and I pray that you will realize, receive, and embrace that gift. Let me pray for us. Let's pray. Father, I pray that the hearts and minds of each of us would be fully open to receive the grace and love you have for us. I pray for the development of spiritual relationships that will grow and nurture each of us. May your Holy Spirit prompt and strengthen those that need to be more intentional about church involvement. And I ask, Lord, for you to call each of us to a deeper commitment to your body your bride, your church. And Father, as Mary taught me, I ask you to grow our hearts in gratitude for your church. I ask that so that the name of Christ would be lifted up and glorified. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. You are dismissed. <laughs>